Let's now talk about viral encephalitides and the immunocompromised host. This is going to be a case-based and a pathogen-based approach. And I'm going to start with a discussion of human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis and human herpes virus type 7, which is basically the same. Um, let's start with a case. This is a 45-year-old male patient who received an MRI of the brain because the patient developed confusion two days after a stem cell transplantation. And what do we see on these images? Well, basically nothing. We see flare images and diffusion-weighted images, which are completely normal. The patient received another MRI two days later because the confusion just got worse and the patient also suffered a first-time seizure. And what do we see now? On the flare images, we now see that both hippocampi as well as the uncle region, or the uncus rather, is swollen and hyperintense, and is also associated with a high signal on diffusion-weighted images, and this was diffusion restriction was dark on the ADC map. If you don't believe me, we can also check these magnified images. These are flare images and diffusion-weighted images, which are completely normal originally. And then two days later, we have clear swelling and an increase in signal intensity on flare images with diffusion restriction. Uh, these images here provide an overview. Here on top, we have the flare images and the diffusion weighted images. This is of the second MRI. And we see that the structures involved are the hippocampus on both sides and also the uncus uh, on both sides. So the mesiotemporal structures and the entire, uh, the hippocampus is entirely involved. So both um, head and body as well as tail associated with diffusion restriction, but on the diffusion-weighted images, I think we can also better appreciate that the abnormalities are completely limited to the hippocampus and the mesiotemporal structures on both sides with no involvement whatsoever of extra limbic cortex. So what is a human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis? What's the difference with human herpes virus type 7? Well, it's basically very simple. Human herpes virus type 6, let's first talk about that, is the most frequent of the two. It is uh, a virus that is responsible in very young children for the development of so-called exanthema subitum, so uh, basically a viral rash. It's a benign and self-limiting disease. And after having suffered a primary infection, patients or people develop a lifelong latency. So the virus remains in the body, but does not cause any harm, does not cause any pathology. It just lies asleep, but it can reactivate, however, in situations in which we are severely immunosuppressed and typically following stem cell transplantation for one reason or another. It causes a limbic encephalitis, so the virus is probably dormant in the olfactory bulb on both sides. Probably, and that's the uh, entry port to uh, the limbic system and the brain. And because it's a limbic encephalitis, the main differential diagnosis is with herpes simplex encephalitis. And it's an important differential because the uh, treatment is different. Uh, herpes simplex encephalitis is treated with acyclovir and a human herpes virus type 6 with gancyclovir. So what's the difference with, uh, between human herpes virus type 6 and type 7? Well, human herpes virus type 6 is the most frequent of the two viruses. And it's a bit unclear. So there is a human herpes virus type 7. Uh, and it looks very, very, very similar genetically and otherwise to human herpes virus type 6. But it's basically a bit unclear if the virus is actually responsible for disease. We know it exists, we know it looks a lot like sick, so it's assumed that it can also cause disease, but uh, it's a bit unclear at the moment. So, and it's also not very important for the sake of this presentation. Uh, how's the prognosis? If you suffer human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis, um, I haven't found any data on mortality rates, uh, but there is severe morbidity because most patients develop uh, very severe long-term neuropsychological deficits, which make sense because the structures involved or the hippocampus, which are, after all, responsible for the formation of long-term memories.
Now, the radiological findings in human herpes virus type 6 I've shown you, uh, and I'm going to repeat them again and mainly focus on the differences between herpes simplex encephalitis. So what do we see in human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis? We have bilateral abnormalities in the mesiotemporal structures, which are extremely symmetrical, very symmetrical. And this in contrast with what we see in herpes simplex encephalitis, uh, in which the um, abnormalities are extremely asymmetrical. Uh, we see abnormalities on T2 weighted images, an increased signal, and on diffusion weighted images, diffusion restriction. Generally, there is no contrast enhancement, and there is generally no extra limbic involvement. So only medial temporal regions are generally involved, which is also in contrast with herpes simplex encephalitis, in which uh, extra limbic and extra temporal structures are often involved. So MRI and human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis can be normal early in the course of the disease. And after the initiation of treatment, uh, there tends to be a complete resolution of the abnormalities, which is also different from what we see in herpes simplex encephalitis. This is the time course of patients with uh, human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis. So originally, the MRI was completely normal. Two days later, there was bilateral hippocampal swelling and edema. And after treatment, the abnormalities have completely disappeared. We see no atrophic gliosis or tissue destruction. And this contrary to what we see in herpes simplex encephalitis in the acute phase, we see clearly asymmetrical uh, cortical temporal edema with also involvement of extratemporal structures and of neocortex. Uh, a month later, we see that these abnormalities are still present. They have not subsided. And another six months later, we see that there are areas of tissue destruction and what is now a hyperintensive flare is uh, no doubt gliosis, so scar tissue and no longer edema. Uh, also because there is a clear enlargement of the temporal horn of the right lateral ventricle, which suggests uh, tissue loss. Let's now talk about cytomegalovirus infection. Uh, cytomegalovirus uh, is best known from the world of pediatric neuroradiology because it is the most frequent congenital infectious cause for the developmental delay and all kinds of uh, neurological abnormalities on MRI. So a very well, relatively frequent congenital brain disorder, infectious brain disorder. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in another presentation on pediatric neuroradiology. Uh, it is rarely the cause of uh, central nervous system infections in adults. And when it does, it will do that in patients with severe immune suppression. And this is one of those patients. What do we see on these images? We see T2 images, flare images, diffusion weighted images, and ADC map. And we see, I have magnified these images for you, we see faint uh, signal increase centrally in the splenium of the corpus callosum. Um, it's a bit hazy on T2 and flare, but clearly visible on diffusion weighted images and the ADC map, and it is diffusion restriction. This entity is, has many names in the medical literature, is sometimes referred to as transient splenial lesions or reversible splenial lesions or transient lesions of the splenium of the corpus callosum or cytotoxic lesions of the corpus callosum. Whatever you call them, they are basically nonspecific. Uh, they used to be described as typical for influenza-associated encephalopathy, but that's not the case. It's an abnormality you can see in a lot of infectious and non-infectious uh, brain disorders. This patient, who was a severely immunosuppressed patient, uh, it was, um, can't really remember what the patient had exactly, but was immunosuppressed, uh, had a brain infection, but it was not influenza. What does the patient have? Let's look at these T1-weighted images with gadolinium, and we see ependymal enhancement, best seen along the frontal horns here of both lateral ventricles, but also present here along the trigone on both sides, and also visible here along the temporal horns on these coronal T1-weighted images. It's a bit discreet, but I believe it's most clear here along the frontal horns of the lateral ventricles. And when you see uh, abnormalities, 
that uh, fit with the ventriculitis and a patient who has severely immunosuppressed always considered cy cytomegalovirus ventriculitis. So as said, cytomegalovirus is basically the most frequent infectious cause of congenital brain disorders. Um, and the adult population, you, you generally, most people develop a cytomegalovirus infection during childhood, can be uh, clinical, can be subclinical, will be asymptomatic for, the most, uh, for most patients. And generally, the virus remains dormant in about 90% of the adult population or is dormant in 90% of the adult population. And reactivation only occurs in severe immunosuppression, but can cause fatal infections. When cytomegalovirus reactivates, it mainly causes um, infections in other systems. It's a uh, cause of retinitis, frequently causes gastrointestinal involvement. And when it reactivates in the central nervous system, it can cause a variety of abnormalities or disorders. It can cause meningitis, encephalitis, ventriculitis, but also myelitis and even polyradiculitis. Of these, ventriculitis, however, is the most frequent central nervous system manifestation. So if you have an immunosuppressed patient with ependymal enhancement, diffusion restriction, and or P2 signal abnormalities, always consider uh, cytomegalovirus ventriculitis. Now, cytomegalovirus encephalitis is a disorder seen in immunosuppressed patients. Typical patients uh, with immunosuppression or patients with HIV uh, because lymphocytes are infected and uh, diminish in these patients, especially CD4 lymphocytes, leading to a situation of decreased immunity and making them very prone to all kinds of opportunistic infections. But HIV patients can also have an uh, infection of the brain by HIV itself. And that is called an HIV encephalopathy. And that is the entity I'm going to talk about now. So what is HIV encephalopathy? Let's start with a case. Let's show you some images. A patient who has clearly suffered a fall on the head. We have, some, uh, sub, uh, we have a small subgallial collection and some uh, subcutaneous uh, infiltration over here, but that's not important. What we see on these flare images is very extensive confluent white matter changes involving the cerebral white matter bilaterally. But if you look carefully, you'll see that the U fibers are spared. They are not involved. The patient has atrophy, and this was a patient uh, in his late 30. So this is, you can say it's mild, but it's still a, a lot for a patient this young. And it looks more extensive here in the perisylvian areas. Also notice the enlargement of the lateral ventricles, which is secondary to tissue loss or volume loss of the brain. On the two weighted images, we basically see the same. We have a combination of atrophy that is too much for the young age of the patient and very extensive confluent white matter changes, especially in the periventricular white matter with sparing of the U fibers. This is another example, and here we see that the atrophy is more pronounced. Once again, a young patient, a patient with HIV, a 41-year-old female patient, we have severe atrophy, and we have some confluent periventricular white matter changes. But here, the atrophy dominates the image more than the white matter abnormalities. Also notice that the atrophy is located supratentorially, and the cerebellum is spared or involved. Uh, basically, there is some mild accentuation of the cerebellar fissures, but not much. So it's mainly a supratentorial atrophy. So what is H encephalopathy? H encephalopathy is basically how we call the imaging features seen in patients with H dementia complex, or also known as HIV-associated dementia, also known as HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. So it's basically a constellation of signs and symptoms leading to cognitive decline in HIV. And that is associated with the imaging appearances I have shown you, and these are called or referred to as an HIV encephalopathy. And what is going on in these patients, what we're looking at is basically the reaction of the brain or the development of brain disease secondary to um, HIV-infected cells in the brain. 
So what cells are infected? Well, uh, macrophages and microglia, these cells are actively infected by HIV. They are present in the brain for enchema, and their presence leads to the secretion of neurotoxins, either by host cells, who do that in response to the presence of infected cells, or by the infected, by the HIV infected macrophages and microglia themselves. The result is basically the development of um, gliosis and some kind of, well, uh, some kind of metabolic or toxic encephalopathy. Uh, and this will lead to the symptoms of cognitive, behavioral, and motor decline or motor disturbances. Uh, what do we see on imaging? We have cerebral atrophy that is disproportionate for the age of the patient, often very extensive confluent periventricular white matter changes with sparing of the U-fibers and no mass effect, no diffusion restriction, and no contrast enhancement whatsoever. The following disease is also a disease uh, characterized by white matter involvement. It's progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. That white matter is involved is clear from the word loco, leukoencephalopathy, and often white matter is involved at multiple places, so it's multifocal. Uh, let's start with the case. This is a 55-year-old 55 year old smoker, male patient, who presented with progressive paresis of the right arm. And what do we see? On T2 and flare images, we have some very faint uh, juxtacortical signal increase in the left precentral gyrus at the level of the hand knob, not associated with diffusion restriction and not associated with contrast enhancement. This was then considered a small subacute ischemic infarction, but six weeks later, the patient received another MRI because the symptoms had, had gotten worse. And we see that these abnormalities have clearly increased in size on T2 and flare images. Uh, they are associated with the high signal on the diffusion weighted images. And once again, there is no diffusion restriction. This time, a suggestion was made that this could be PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, and the patient was tested for HIV and was positive. So this was PML. What is PML exactly? Well, PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, is a syndrome or a constellation um, of clinical and radiological findings caused by the John Cunningham virus. And this is also a virus that is present in a lot of people uh, in the general population. Um, most people suffer a primal infection without realizing it, without knowing it, and then the virus becomes latent, uh, mainly in the kidneys, but it can reactivate in cases of severe immunosuppression. And those are typically HIV patients, but can also happen in multiple sclerosis patients who are treated with uh, natalizumab. Um, in the brain, the John Gunningham virus has a predilection for the oligodendrocytes, so the cells of the white matter. And that explains why what we see is basically a white matter disorder. The infection of the oligodendrocytes leads to death of oligodendrocytes and demyelination. Um, and that explains our imaging findings. These are T2-weighted images and flare images. And what do we see in PML? We see very extensive, also very hyper-intense changes in the white matter uh, here of the uh, left frontal lobe. But despite their extensive size, there is very little, well, basically no mass effect because we are looking at a process associated with tissue loss, tissue destruction. So um, there is no mass effect uh, caused by these abnormalities. Also notice that the juxtacortical uh, white matter is involved. So the, the, the U fibers are involved um, and that there is extension of the lesion to the contralateral hemisphere through the corpus callosum. Um, as we magnify these images a bit, we see that this is the region of the a rather a large white matter lesion, whoops, uh, which is a very sharply delineated along the cortex, but a bit unsharp, where there is no border with the normal white matter. And notice that there is no mass effect and clear U-fiber involvement. 
the flare images we have already seen, but on these unenhanced the one weighted images, we also see that the lesion is a very high point tense, but really very high point tense. Most CNS pathology is hypo intense on T1, but not this dark, not this hypo. And this is very characteristic for PML because the demyelination leads to a sort of microcystic tissue destruction with a high water content. And this is responsible for a relatively high or no, rather a very low signal on T1 and can sometimes also be associated with signal suppression on flare images. On diffusion-weighted images, we see facilitated diffusion centrally in the lesion. So there is no high uh, signal here on the diffusion, but a high signal on the ADC map. So this is facilitated diffusion. Uh, we see that the lesion is generally high in signal. Uh, this is in a large part due to T2 shine through, but there is also an area with somewhat lower signal on the edge over here, corresponding to a leading edge of diffusion restriction, which is an area of active demyelination and active infection. I will show you another example uh, soon. This is not the nicest example. If you magnify these images a bit more, we also see a lot of very small punctate T2 and flare lesions uh, along the borders of the, let's say the biggest lesion or the main lesion. And this is referred to as the Milky Way sign because it looks a bit like the Milky Way. And it is probably perivascular or these small punctate lesions probably correspond to uh, the perivascular spaces which are filled or infiltrated with CD8 lymphocytes. Um, this sign is very suggestive for PML because you will not see this in, for instance, a patient with a tumefactive demyelination. And here is the Milky Way and you can understand where the thing got its name from. So what are typical imaging findings in PML? So we have uh, an abnormality that can be solitary and unilateral, but can be bilateral. Uh, if it's bilateral, it's uh, generally very asymmetrical. U-fibers are uh, generally involved and the abnormal abnormality typically starts in the cortical white matter and then spreads to the uh, deep white matter. So in a patient with severe immunosuppression, there is no contrast enhancement because contrast enhancement is a sign of an inflammatory response by the host. If the host cannot mount an inflammatory response, there will not be contrast enhancement. And there is often a leading edge of diffusion restriction where we have the area of active demyelination and active infection. Once again, a comparison of flare and T1. Notice that the abnormality is a very high point tense on T1 weighted images. And we see here some very small areas of a lower signal on flare due to signal suppression. The Milky Way sign can also be observed on T1 weighted images with gadolinium in patients who are capable of mounting an inflammatory response. So in this patient, either the immunity is recovering or is not completely suppressed. And we see some very punctate contrast enhancing lesions in the region of the main lesion. So the, here, this is sometimes also referred to as a Milky Way sign. This is a comparison of a patient with HIV encephalopathy and PML. And what do we see? In the patient with HIV encephalopathy, we see patchy confluent white matter changes. These are extremely magnified flare images. The U-fibers are spared, so here are the U-fibers. These are not involved at all. While in PML, there is clear U-fiber involvement. The white matter changes to reach all the way up to the cortex. And this is HIV encephalopathy, this is PML. And here we have a comparison of the one-weighted images between a patient with HIV encephalopathy and PML. So notice that the white matter changes are somewhat grayish in HIV encephalopathy, but they are very high point tense, very dark in a patient with PML. Now let's go back to our first case. So this 55-year-old male patient, the smoker, uh, who was originally believed to have suffered a small ischemic stroke, but then came back to us a couple of weeks later, and then a suggestion was made that this was PML. Well, this patient tested positive for HIV. Uh, PML was confirmed also by a lumbar puncture, and the patient was started on antiretroviral therapy. And because the patient is started on antiretroviral therapy, um, 
the patient uh, develops some improvements uh, in his immune system and you think, okay, that's good. Now everything will improve. But after the start of antiretroviral therapy, the patient received another MRI a couple of weeks later. And this is what the PML lesion now looks like. It has clearly increased in size on T2 and flared images, dramatically, I'd say, probably associated with some edema. Um, there is facilitated diffusion centrally, which means that tissue is probably destroyed over here uh, because there is a lot of space for water molecules to move freely to diffuse. Uh, maybe some leading edge diffusion along the edges over here with some lower signal on the ADC map, uh, but not that important. And what is important or what we don't see in a typical PML infection in a patient who is severely immunosuppressed, we have a very patchy uh, contrast enhancement in the lesion and along the edges of the lesion with some Milky Way sign present as well. So this... It's basically what PML IRIS looks like. What is IRIS? IRIS is an acronym that stands for Immune Reconstitution Inflammatory Syndrome. And the name basically says it's all. Uh, the immune system recovers following the start of antiviral therapy. But now patients are able to generate an inflammatory response to whatever opportunistic process is uh, going on in the body. And this will actually lead to a more dramatic, uh, to more dramatic findings on imaging. So things look worse before they start to look better, uh, and can also lead to um, a worsening of the clinical signs and symptoms. And on imaging and a PML iris, so the PML will look worse, uh, worse at first. We have signs of mass effect now. We have uh, some edema. We have contrast enhancement, but this is all generated by the host response to the PML and not by the PML itself. So we can have two situations. Either the patient has PML that was radiologically occult before uh, the, the start of the antiretroviral therapy, or patient had known PML as an R patient that got worse after the initiation of therapy. And what we see is this mass effect edema and contrast enhancement. Here is another nice example. This is a patient with two large PML lesions in the left frontal and parietal lobes, clearly seen on T2 and flare, extending all the way to the cortex, so extracortical involvement, with the leading edge of diffusion here, very nice, and no contrast enhancement whatsoever. And after the initiation of antiviral therapy, two months later, we see that the abnormalities have clearly increased in size. They are now bridging one another, the diffusion abnormalities are bridging, and we have also uh, contrast enhancement along the edges of the lesion. So another example of PML iris. So that concludes this presentation on viral encephalitis and uh, immunocompromised patient. What do I want you to remember? You should consider the possibility of human herpes virus type 6 encephalitis when you see perfectly symmetrical bilateral mesotemporal encephalitis in a patient after stem cell transplantation. You should consider cytomegalovirus ventriculitis when you see well, basically imaging findings fitting ventriculitis like ependymal enhancement or diffusion restriction in an immunocompromised patient. You should consider HIV encephalopathy when you see confluent periventricular white matter changes with sparing of the U-fibers and disproportionate atrophy in an HIV patient and lastly, PML, when you see one or more white metal lesions with U-fiber involvement in an HIV patient. And when these are associated with mass effect and contrast enhancement, you are probably dealing with PML iris. Thank you very much for watching.